Hello everyone and welcome to Reaper 101, part 1, The Basics. I'm your host Adam Steele and this is part of a 10 part series on YouTube uh, designed to get you through the basics of using Reaper start to finish so that you can get working with your music production, voiceover, whatever it is that you want to do with Reaper, let's try and get you there. If you're looking for a much more in-depth, ultra detailed, everything start to finish, you can consider looking at the Ultimate Reaper Guide on Pro Mix Academy, where I take you through everything start to finish with every detail, every cool tip and trick, some more advanced features, a full recording session, a mix session, master session in Reaper using just stock plugins to show you exactly what can be done in this incredibly affordable package. Now, on with the show. I should note at this point that Reaper 7 is just around the corner as of filming this video. Uh, the next few videos, the parts one, two, and three, I'm using the most recent public version, which is Reaper 6.82, to show you what's going on. But if you get Reaper 7 and watch this series, everything is in exactly the same places. Everything looks a little more shiny, but the concepts and all the buttons and controls and everything are in the same places. So fear not, there is a lot of similarity between versions of Reaper, you know, four, five, six, seven. They try and keep things in the same place so that you're not having to do big shifts in between software changes. So yes, as Reaper 7 comes out, the newer parts of the series will feature Reaper 7, but for now, uh, Reaper 6, you will see all the controls, like the audio selection and where folders and tracks and all that kind of stuff goes, will be the same throughout. So even if your software looks a little bit different to this, all the buttons, they're in the same place. Now Reaper is incredibly powerful, but when it starts out, it can be a little bit terrifying. This is part one of the series, but there is a part zero where I talk about why you might choose Reaper over other software, other platforms. This can work on Windows, Mac, it works on Linux, it works on pretty much any modern computer. It's $60 for the discounted license, and I think it's around 250 for the commercial license, which is what I use as a working recording studio. The trial, however, is a 60 day trial, but it doesn't stop working at the end of that trial. I think the developers decided that uh, if you want to keep using it or you need it for something, it's better to just let you keep using it than just lock you out. It's important to say that Reaper is not free, even though it will keep working in trial mode indefinitely. I'm not employed or sponsored by the guys at Cocos, the company that make Reaper. I don't even know if they know that I make these videos, uh, but it's worth saying because piracy is you know, not ideal and you don't have to do that with Reaper. If you can afford to pay for it, uh, please do, uh, but if not, it will keep working for you. Now, most of the setup that I'm going to do today, I'm going to do on my MacBook Air. This is an M2 MacBook. Um, Reaper does work on Intel and Apple Silicon Macs, also works on Windows PCs, and also, like I said, Linux on various different distributions, uh, including things like Raspberry Pis, Steam Decks, all sorts of stuff. To download the version we need, we're going to go to reaper.fm and go to the download tab. Here you'll find a list of the different versions that you might need. For this computer, I need the one that says Mac OS 10.15 plus because this is uh, Mac OS 13 as of time recording this video. And this is Reaper 6.82, which is the current version. I can't see there being any huge changes between now and Reaper 7, so this should be fine for a while. So I'll click download and that will come up in my downloads. It's a universal binary, which means it's the same download for Apple Silicon and Intel Macs. Before we get that installed, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is audio interfaces. I have the Audient ID24 right here, but you can use pretty much any modern 
interface that you wish from any manufacturer that you wish, they should all work perfectly well with Reaper. However, it's highly recommended that you download the drivers for your particular audio interface from the website of the manufacturer for that interface because that will make the best connection, hardware speaking and software, between your interface and your computer. That way you should be able to see all the inputs and outputs, have the, the best performance, and generally have the best possible time. Quite often, audio interfaces will work without special interface drivers, but it's highly recommended to get them. So in my case here, I'm going to go to audient.com, go to products in ID 24, go to the downloads tab, and download the Mac driver. Now, before opening any programs, I'm going to install both the ID driver for my ID24, and I'm going to install Reaper. The process for these is exactly the same on Windows. It's slightly different on Linux, but if you're running Linux, you're probably quite comfortable with running a shell script. So I'll see you back here once those are installed. Now my ID software for the ID interface has brought up this mixer here, which I can see, which is going to be very useful in the future. And now we can open Reaper. Now on a Mac, you'll find it under applications on your finder. And personally, I like to drag and drop Reaper onto the dock here. Similarly with Windows, by default, Reaper opens the previous project, but we're going to change that in our preferences later. I personally like it to open a blank page each time so I can choose which project to work on without waiting for it to load, perhaps a project that I might not be working on on that given day. Let's double click that. On a Mac, it says this is an app downloaded from the internet. Are you sure you want to open it? Yes, we downloaded it from reaper.fm, so we're quite confident that this is safe. Now, the first time you open Reaper, you will get some sort of message saying an audio interface has not been chosen. And at that point, you open it. In this case, it's telling me there's an error that there are no external headphones plugged in because that was the device I was last using. On a Mac, you can use the external headphones or the internal speakers as an audio interface, as we'll see shortly. So I'll close this, double click the bar at the top to make this bigger on the screen. And at the top where it says audio device closed, this is the same on most operating systems. We give that one click and go to audio device settings. And that brings up the audio device settings. So on a Mac, we can drop this down and I'm going to choose the Audient ID24. If I don't happen to have an interface with me, let's say I'm working on a train or other public transport, or I just don't happen to have an interface with me, I can choose external headphones or MacBook Air speakers. Right now, the external headphones are not found simply because there's no headphone connection jacked in. If you have Bluetooth headphones connected to your Mac, they will also come up in this list. On a PC, the selection is similar, but there are two drop-down menus here. One would be audio device type, which is choosing between direct sound, ACO, and other drivers. I always recommend picking ACO, A-S-I-O, because that's the most efficient CPU performance-wise and lowest latency type of audio driver that Windows supports. And from there, you should, since you install the drivers for your interface, have the choice of an ACO driver in there. On Linux, there are choices between ALSA, Jack, and others. I'm not particularly well up on Linux, but if you need to check the options for that, there are forums and there are plenty of Linux support that will help you to do that. Below that, we can request a sample rate. Now, the sample rate is an important thing to pick because this defines how our system is going to operate. There are a few generally accepted choices that work with audio hardware like interfaces and 44100 is the accepted CD standard. 48,000 or 48 kilohertz is the accepted film and DVD standard. 96,000 or 96K is a higher quality 
ultra high fidelity kind of way of working that a lot of professional recording studios use at the cost of using double the hard drive space, double the CPU processing for anything. And that can be something that's really relevant to you if you're producing with uh, someone else who is working in the same sample rate. If you're collaborating with someone else, try and keep the same sample rate between everybody. Try and agree that beforehand. It will make things easier in the long run. Below that, we have request block size, and that is latency. So whenever we plug an interface into a computer, whether it's USB or Thunderbolt or a card that goes straight into a PC on PCI Express or an older device that's Firewire or anything else that hasn't been kind of made the big thing yet, but may well be when you're watching this video, they all need to connect somehow to the computer's main processor. And to do that, it takes a little bit of time for that digital audio to be sent over the connection, interpreted by Reaper, any processing with plugins or whatever it is that you're doing, and then in real time almost, it has to be then spit back out so you can hear that on headphones, speakers, whatever it is that you're doing. And to do that safely without any kind of dropouts, uh, brief periods of silence which can cause horrible pops and clicks, there has to be a thing called a buffer. And that buffer is just a little bit, a certain number of the samples, because this samples, like we said on the screen, 48,000 times per second, that gives us a little bit of kind of a, a notice period, if you like, so that if anything is busy on the computer and it can't quite handle things, which happens a lot, it has, in this case, a buffer of 256 samples, to kind of scramble and fill that buffer back up. This happens all the time with digital audio, but it happens invisibly in the background. The kind of trade-off of this is that the more buffer we give it, the longer it takes for that audio in real time to go from, say, a microphone or a guitar through the interface, through Reaper, through whatever processing you're doing with it, and then back out of those speakers. So that causes what we call latency which is an added delay. Now, a very small delay, a very small latency, is not even noticeable by the human ear. There is a certain tolerance within which we don't even perceive a delay, which is fantastic and can be used in a really powerful kind of way. But once we get beyond a certain point, we find that, especially with the real-time recording and real-time monitoring, it can become quite distracting. Buffers tend to have more timing built on something like a USB interface because of the way that USB works. They tend to be lower latency and better performance on interfaces like Thunderbolt because that connects directly from the interface to the processor in the PC, the Mac, whatever it is that you're using. So the kind of the middleman is cut out, so to speak. So you do have more leeway. If you are not recording or processing things live and you're mixing something, so you're just hitting play and the computer can spend some time preparing, then it's quite possible for you to put a larger block size in here to give the computer a bit more breathing room so that we don't hear any pops, clicks and dropouts. Generally speaking, most modern interfaces tend to use buffers that are what we call powers of two. A very low one would be 32 samples, and then it goes up 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. If you put in a number that's in between these, you may find there's some strange behavior going on. Now, some interfaces that you use, you might have to click the audio MIDI setup button here as well. And that will bring up the options for your audio interface. On Mac, that brings up the audio devices, on PC, that tends to bring up the ACO control panel for your particular interface. Quite often these days, a lot of interfaces have their own mixer software, like the ID mixer right here. And this software has all the system settings in there under a system panel. And that way we can control the finer and more kind of advanced 
points of our interface. Generally, the larger and more complex interfaces tend to have more settings, but smaller, more simple interfaces tend to have less that needs to be changed. We also have a tick box here for allowing projects to override the device sample rate, which means if you've got a project where you've saved in that project that it is working at a particular sample rate, say 44.1K or 96K, this tick box allows those projects to then send a signal to the interface to say, hey, we're now going to change to working at this speed. Unticking this means that then we're forcing the sample rate to always be at what we've defined here. Now, let's move on to creating a track, inserting some audio, and then recording something. At this point, before we start diving in with things like microphones and headphones and all that kind of stuff, let's talk about something important with the philosophy of Reaper. I know that sounds flowery, but it's something that's really important, and that's tracks. In other DAWs, you'll see instrument tracks, audio tracks, MIDI tracks, FX tracks, AUX tracks, all that kind of segmenting into different types. Reaper doesn't work like that. Reaper simply has tracks. If you make a track, you can add anything you like to it. You can send it to anywhere you like. You can have MIDI on there. You can have mono audio, stereo audio surround sound audio, video, you can have literally anything on any track and Reaper will just handle it. And that's quite freeing, but at the same time, it can be a little bit daunting. It's just something that we have to adjust to. So the first thing we're going to do is make a track and add some audio to it. In a big, nice blank project here, I'm going to double click in this big blank left space and that brought me up a new track. And I'm just gonna make that a little bit larger. You can make them as big or small as you like, depending on what you want to see on the screen. And from here, the first thing I'm going to do is go to insert at the top and the first thing, media file. And then from here, I'm just going to choose an audio file. In this case, I'm using the song Night Drive by the guys at JHS Pedals. They've given this to the YouTube audio library, so it's something I can play on YouTube without getting in trouble. And so that has appeared on my track. And as you can see, it's a stereo track, left and right. And that's usually the way that songs are. You know, when you're, you're delivered a file, it's usually stereo, left and right. If I was to import a media file that was just one thing, like one guitar, one bass, something like that, that would be mono, and that would just come in as one big block. However, that would not make this a mono track. The way that Reaper sees everything is in pairs of channels. Generally speaking, channels one and two are the left and right for outputs. We'll come on to having more channels on the same track later, because that can get a little bit advanced. But all you need to know now is that generally speaking, everything is stereo, even if there's a mono source dropped on there. If I hit play on this, you should be able to hear a little bit, bit of it. I'm clicking around on the top bar here. This is the timeline. And if I left click anywhere, that moves the playhead. And what's going to happen then is if I hit play, that will play from that point onwards. So I'm going to hit space bar for play. And we have some playback. There are some controls on the left here that you can see as well. There is a volume knob, which I think by default is a slider. And we'll talk about adjusting that later. I personally prefer it as a knob, but you can have it as a slider. And the other thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to make this a little smaller again, is I'm going to bring up the mixer. So I'm going to go to view at the top and click on mixer. And this bottom half now, this is the mixer because generally speaking in Reaper and almost any DAW, you're going to see your tracks in two completely different ways. One is this edit window, which is kind of the main window, the first one we looked at. 
where all of your files, whether they're waves, whether they're MIDI, whether they're anything else, get represented in a left to right kind of fashion as time goes on, as you hit play, that goes from left to right. And then at the bottom here is the mixer. If I add a whole new bunch of tracks, you'll see as I make them smaller on the top window, that they are copied from the top screen to the bottom screen because they're just different ways of looking at the same thing. If I call these silly names, like, I don't know, Steve, George, Phil, Dave, you'll see that as I'm naming these by just double clicking in the blank space where the name is, I did that down in the mixer window, but I could also do it on the edit window. And you'll see how those names have all appeared on both sides. If I click on one track to highlight it, it's also highlighted down below. If I grab the bar in between the mix window and the edit window, I can make this bigger or smaller. And as I make it bigger or smaller, certain buttons and sliders start to get hidden or shown. That's something that happens in Reaper that can save on clutter on screen. If I want to, let's say this is the smallest that the mixer can get. So I can see sliders for the volume of everything. I can see record buttons, mutes, solos, but some of the more advanced features are hidden. If I just make this slider go up and make these bigger, more advanced things start to appear like a phase uh, polarity buttons, automation buttons, and two big holes right here for inserts and sends. I'll come back to those. I'm going to hide the mixer again with the shortcut Apple M. Control M on Windows, and we can look at maybe recording some audio. So I'll move my playhead to after the track that we imported because we don't want to play two things at once. If you do want to play two things at once, let's say you've got a backing track for karaoke and you want to record your audio, then that is exactly what you would do is you would have the playhead at the start. I'm using the mouse wheel, by the way, to zoom in and out here you would have the playhead start from the beginning and your track that you want to record audio on now would be armed and ready to go. So that's the next thing we're going to do is get ready to record some audio from this microphone right here. This is a nice vocal microphone. So I'm going to plug this in with an XLR cable and I'm going to plug that into channel one on my interface, plug it into any channel you like, but in my case, I'm using channel one. Now, what I'm going to do next is hit the little red button on, let's say on the channel Steve, and I'll make that a little bigger so we can see all the controls. And we're ready on analog one. If I click on where it says analog one, that only appears when I hit record arm. That's what the red button is, record arm. We're not recording right now, but if I was to hit the big record button at the bottom, then that particular track that we've chosen would begin to record. The same could be done for as many tracks as you like. At once you can arm record on loads of tracks. I've still yet to find a limit. However, we're not seeing anything happening on the levels. First things first, this microphone needs 48 volt phantom power. That's very much dependent on your interface, your microphone. This microphone needs it. This interface can supply it. That's not something that is Reaper specific. That is just general audio practice. And we're still not seeing much because I need to turn up the gain knob on that particular channel, which again is not a Reaper specific thing, but is worth knowing. So if I turn that up so I'm getting a good healthy level in a singing kind of capacity, this would be much closer to my face. So I probably wouldn't need to have the gain turned up as high, but I want to make sure that I can see what I'm doing. But you can see now on the screen that those levels are bouncing up and down as I speak. If I show the mixer again with that shortcut, we can see that also down here, Steve is ready to record. And you can also see at the top of the track in red, it says plus 0.0. .0. And what that means is that there has been an overload. What happened is when I turned on the 48 volts on the channel, with that being ready, that caused a big pop because quite often microphones do that. And so the warning is that that would have been recorded with some horrible distortion because it's too loud. We know that now we have the gain set so we can reset 
that meter, tell it not to panic, by clicking in that red area. And that's changed the colours now back from that more aggressive warning red to a more kind of record light red. Now, this is coming through monitoring through Reaper. If I put on my headphones now, I should be able to hear that. And it's not particularly loud, so I'll turn up my headphone volume. But it could be louder, that's to do with the game. You have to play with balance. Try not to distort things. General advice, when you're recording audio, it tends to be quite a bit lower in level than a finished, mastered track. So be prepared to turn up your monitors or your headphones or whatever it is you're listening through quite a bit higher than if you had fully mastered tracks blasting through at full volume. You do need to have some kind of room to breathe at the top with all your instruments or whatever it is recording all at the same time. So do be aware of that. That's called headroom. I can now hear this with a very short amount of that latency delay. It's barely noticeable, but I can hear it. In this case, this is coming through Reaper. So this sound from my voice is going through that microphone into the interface, into Reaper, monitored through this monitoring little speaker icon here, and then back through the ID24 interface. If I click this speaker icon twice to turn that monitoring off, that level is now gone and you're having to hear me through the microphone above the camera. So depending on what I'm doing, I might not want to hear the audio through Reaper at all. I might want to have something playing back, like a backing track. Maybe if I have something like a guitar amplifier that I can hear in the room, I don't need to hear two copies of the audio, but I can rest assured that that will record. If I need to hear this in real time, in my case, I'm going to need to open the ID mixer from Audient and turn up a slider on the sound coming directly from the microphone straight through the interface without going through Reaper. If you have this turned up or the equivalent on your brand interface and live monitoring in Reaper, you will come across a problem that I call ghosting, where you've got two copies of the same audio slightly off from each other, so you get this weird kind of hollow sound. So I highly recommend using either Reaper's inbuilt monitoring or your interface's direct monitoring, not both. Now from here, with the play headset where I want to start recording, I can now hit the record button. And as you can see on the screen there, it's starting to record my voice. If I hit stop and then play, it's going to sound like this. And as you can see on the screen there, it's starting to record my voice. If I hit stop and then play, it's going to sound like this. And so there we have our first recording in Reaper. Now, if you're recording voiceover, this may be all you need. At this point, you can then record sections by moving the playhead after where you were just recording and just keep doing this and build that up. However, if you're working with music production, you may well find that you need to start working with tempos and metronomes. It's very, very common in music production to have a set tempo for a song. There are a few ways to work out what the tempo of your song may be. Um, there are tempo calculators. Uh, you may well have uh, sheet music that tells you what the tempo is going to be. If not, down here is a number by default, 120, 120 BPM. It seems to be the default in most DAWs these days because that's a nice even two beats per second. So it's very easy to calculate, but we can change that by just where it says BPM above, hovering the mouse over and it changes to tap. And then we click the mouse or the trackpad, whatever it is that you're using at the tempo that our song is going to be. It seems we've landed on 101, like Reaper 101. That's a nice coincidence. Now, at this point, any audio that I had in the project will now be time stretched because the original was 120, this is now 101. So this will play back slower. And as we can see here, a ratio of 0.842 times of real time, 
but it should stay in pitch. That's quite loud, so I'm going to turn the fader down. But we can hear that that song is still in the original pitch that we imported it at, but it's now playing back slower. We can do this if we want to record with a backing track, but we want it to be faster or slower. You can change the tempo in Reaper at any time, and that will change everything in that project. So it stays where it was in terms of relation to everything else in the song, but everything kind of compresses and then plays faster or slower, relatively. At this point, we can use our tempo and the metronome. So in the top left corner of Reaper, you'll see a metronome icon that's currently dim that says metronome disabled. If we click that with the left click, that's now enabled. And if we right click on that icon as well, that gives us all the settings for the metronome. As a good general rule in Reaper at this point, I should point out that pretty much anything that you see in Reaper, if you left click on it, that will tend to activate or deactivate whatever it is you're hovering over. But if you right click, that will tend to give you a context menu of some kind for that icon. So metronome right click there, we got the metronome settings. The snap, which we'll talk about in a minute, that will give me snap grid settings if I right click and so on and so forth. There are undo histories and the undo button. There are so many different things that you can do in Reaper where there are sub menus that are exactly under the thing that you'll find. Talking about speed and efficiency in Reaper, this is kind of the main philosophy of the Reaper design, is that everything is, there are, there are thousands, tens of thousands of things you can do in Reaper, but generally speaking, each deep dive menu is hidden under the simple button for whatever it is you're looking for. Everything under the metronome seems to look good, so we'll hide that, and if I was to hit record from here, One and two and a three and a four and one and two and three and a four. I could hear the metronome, I could record along to that. That metronome is not recorded onto the track that I was working with. If I play that back, one and two and a three and a four, I can turn off the metronome now. One and two and a three and a four and one and two and three and a four. Any little bit of metronome you could then hear on the vocal was these headphones bleeding some of the metronome sound into the microphone. So do be aware of that. Um, for that reason, I quite often use in-ear monitors when I'm recording or uh, closed back headphones, which don't let too much of the sound bleed out into the microphone. Again, that's not a Reaper thing. That's just an audio production tip. Okay, in a second, we're going to talk about MIDI. But before we do, let's talk about something really important and that is saving your work because we've been recording without actually saving anywhere. We didn't make a new project or anything. We just dived right in. And that's something that Reaper allows you to do. It has a default folder, generally in your documents folder. So if you start recording and you've lost the original files, that's where they'll be, usually in your documents under Reaper kind of media. So we're going to go to file and save project as, and I'm going to make myself a new folder. Generally documents is good unless you have a separate drive or something and then make myself a new folder in here called Reaper 101. Helps when you can spell. And so I'm gonna call this Reaper 101 part one. And I have a tick box that is create subdirectory for projects. So inside that Reaper 101, it'll make a new folder for this. So if I make different songs or different parts, that will make a folder for each one of them for nice, neat organization. And then there's copy all media into project directory or move all media into project directory. So any files that have already been recorded that were in a place we didn't want them to be, we can do save project as, and then copy all the files to a new place, or if we know they're not supposed to be there, move them all, and then hit save. So that copied both of these files out into my uh, new folder, which is now done. So when we're going to talk about MIDI, and keyboards and virtual MIDI and all that kind of stuff because MIDI doesn't actually make sound on its own. First thing we're going to do is close down Reaper with uh, Reaper and quit Reaper and then plug in this keyboard. 
This is a USB MIDI keyboard, which makes it really easy. All I have to do is plug it into this, this dock that I have down here. If you're on a Windows PC, you don't even need the dock. You can plug straight in, or if you've got a USB-C cable, again, you don't necessarily need a dock. That's just what I have to plug more things into this MacBook than there are ports on the Mac. If you've got an older style keyboard that just has the five pin MIDI cable, you will need some sort of MIDI to USB box. Uh, companies like uh, Motu and uh, companies like Motu and ESI make uh, loads of different uh, MIDI to USB uh, converter boxes because that way you can just plug your MIDI instrument straight into that and then they get treated as a USB device. That also can be separate from your audio interface because MIDI is just numbers, just data, and the two can live in harmony quite separately from each other, which is a good thing because quite often you'll see people with like a MIDI drum pad and a MIDI keyboard and another MIDI keyboard, and having to have that integrated into the audio interface would be a huge pain. A lot of MIDI USB devices like keyboards don't need their own drivers. Some do, so like we did with the audio drivers before, do just check with the manufacturer's website that that's needed or not needed and make sure that's installed as appropriate. So now we've opened Reaper again, now that the MIDI device is plugged in and installed, all that kind of stuff. The next thing we'll need to do is go to the options menu and somewhere that you may see several times, which is settings. In here, there's the audio device that we saw before. That is a shortcut from above that brings us straight to here, but straight below audio device is MIDI devices. And in here, we should now see our plugged in device. Now this keyboard's a little bit special, the Keylab Mark 288. It's got DAW and MIDI. Now the DAW stuff is that there's a set of like play, pause, control uh, buttons on the keyboard that are quite separate and we'll come to that much later in this series when we talk about remote controls. But for now we want to focus solely on MIDI, that is to say the keys and any of the sliders and knobs that affect sounds. So this is pretty much an input only device. So we need to go to MIDI input here, right click on the one that says MIDI and tick enable input. Once we hit okay, we can then have our new kind of George track. I like to give them silly names enabled and under the input, we change it from where it was originally input mono analog one to input MIDI, then the Archuria keyboard. And then I'm going to choose all channels. And we should know that this works because when I hit some keys, we see a yellow square. And as I hit the keys harder, the line next to it jumps up higher, that is velocity. Also in this case, if I have the keyboard in a regular mode, as I turn sliders and dials and knobs, they should all register with the yellow square appearing to show me that something's happening. However, if I hit record here and play some keys, it doesn't matter if I play something beautiful or something absolutely horrible, we're not going to hear anything. And that's because MIDI on its own is just a bunch of numbers. It doesn't actually make any sound. Now, in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, if you got one MIDI keyboard and hooked it up to another MIDI, say, synthesizer, then the cable from one to the other would make that synthesizer immediately start making noises because those numbers from the MIDI keyboard you're playing on would be triggering the other device's sound generating hardware to start doing something. So what we're going to do at this point is talk about effects and specifically we're going to talk about inserts. That is something that is inserted in between our MIDI numbers and what we're going to hear from the speakers. The easiest way to do this is in the mixer window at the bottom. We'll see there are two sets of blank bars. The top one is the inserts. The bottom one is the sends, which we'll come to later. But in the inserts, if I click in one of these empty bars, this will bring up the effects window. There are a few other places to find this. If we're looking, I'll just close this. If we're looking on the uh, edit window, 
each track should have a little tab that says FX. If we click that, that brings up the same window and any insert effects that we have on the track will appear in there. Now, Reaper doesn't come with very much in terms of virtual instruments that can interpret MIDI. It comes with a sampler, Samplomatic, uh, Resynth, which is a very simple synthesizer, but then you can manipulate that any way that you see fit. Or alternatively, you can purchase or find free uh, different third party virtual instruments. And in this case, I'm going to use the Archuria B3 because I just happen to have it installed on this Mac. Now with the record monitor enabled and the interface good to go and everything record armed with the keyboard selected, I should be able to play some notes. As you could hear there, that's me live monitoring what I'm playing. Alternatively, we don't have to live monitor if we already have MIDI information like this thing here. If I was to hit play on this now, now it doesn't sound very pretty because I wasn't really aware of what I was playing. I was just hitting notes with no reference, which is why it's always good to live monitor with virtual instruments. Make sure that speaker icon is engaged so you can hear what it is that you're doing. And that's where the thing from earlier about latency becomes important. If you're trying to play something like a virtual piano, if there's too much of a delay there, that can really be quite off-putting. So let's now record something to a metronome because we're going to edit it. So with our metronome on, There we go. And as we can hear, there is some background noise. That is a uh, part of this analog emulation of a vintage instrument that can be uh, removed in the options, but I'll leave everything exactly as it is. So let's open this up now by double clicking on the, uh, the item. And we can see this is what's called the piano roll. This is a very good way to see how a MIDI performance has been played. Each one of these left to right is a note that I played and the color is relative to how hard that was hit, which is less relevant to something like a, a tone wheel organ and more relevant to something like a piano or a virtual drum. Let's play that back and see how it sounds. Now let's say that this note was hit too hard here. If I click on it, it lights up and at the bottom, we can see little sticks for how hard they were hit for velocity. If I bring this down, that note will now be represented by something slightly less hard. So if you have a performance, if you're not the best musician in the world, I find sometimes I'm a little bit heavy handed with a piano. I can kind of bash the notes in and if one's a little quiet or a little loud, I can correct them here. Also, if one's early or late, let's zoom in a little, I can turn off the snap feature, snap to grid, which the grid feature is good for keeping things on time. If I was to move something on its own, I can move this note early or late by going left or right. So now, That's now changed the feel entirely because that note that was in time is now early. But if I snap to grid, I can now bring everything perfectly in. And another thing that I could do, if I select all these notes with a right click and a drag of a box, I can go to the Q icon up here, which is quantize. Now what quantize will do is it will lock the start of each note to the closest option of the, uh, the, the notes. So the, the grid, the metronome, is what defines how accurate everything is. If I change this to be manual quantize, and let's say quarter notes, we can now see that has moved everything around. 
Let's change it to eighth notes and press play. And that sounds much more in time, although it has slightly lost that human feel. It really depends what you're going for, and you can use strength of quantization to pull things round a little bit, but not have them perfect. And there are other options in here that you can play around with as well. If I hit OK, that's now a nicely tightened up performance. After effects inserts, I'm now going to talk about sends. The way that a lot of people in the analog world work, me included, is that quite often we'll have something like, say, a reverb or a delay or something like that that's on its own separate track. So then let's say we have 20 or 30 different things going on in a song. We've got different drums, bass, guitars. We don't want to have 20 or 30 different reverbs going on. That could be incredibly complicated, very heavy and hard on the computer. That can be a very difficult way to go. So instead, what we often do is have something like a reverb on its own, because then we can have a little bit of, say, the drums going to a reverb, a little bit of the bass or the guitars or the vocals going to that same reverb, and then we only need one copy. And the way that we do that is with a thing called Ascend. So again, in Reaper, everything is just a track. There are no special types of track. So what I'm going to do is make a whole new track, and I'm going to name this at the bottom, Reverb Send. You don't have to call it Send, you can call it whatever you like, but this kind of naming system does help me to keep things clear and focused. I also personally like to put send effects on the right hand side of my project. You don't have to do that either, That you can organise things exactly how you like. So on this reverb send, I'm going to add an insert effect that is a reverb. In the all plugins category, there are quite a few third party plugins here that I have bought, but one that comes with Reaper is Reverb. There's Reverb 8, that's the one I'm going to use today. This is a very simple reverb, and I'm going to make sure the dry signal in here is all the way off, because the dry signal is the not reverb, the, the not affected sound, and the wet is the name we give to the affected sound, so the sound that comes through the reverb. If we were going to use this plugin on top of a single track, we would use the wet and dry to blend the original sound with an amount of reverb. The way that I'm working as a send, we tend to use 100% wet and no dry signal at all. Otherwise you start to get doubling up a volume on sounds that you're sending from your original tracks to this new reverb. And we don't really want that. That makes life difficult. Let's just say that the settings on here are perfect as they are. We, we might want a different reverb sound in the future, but there are different reverb units that we can use to make that happen. But let's just say that this JHS track, and let's turn off that metronome. Let's just say that this needs some reverb. So what we can do is go to our little button here, which has three stripes for sends, receives. So th that's the routing button. Now, a lot of this will be covered later on in routing videos, but this is the basic. In here, we can see a thing called sends. And so in sends, I can click to add a new send, and I'm going to add this to reverb send. Now by default, I'm going to move this over here. We have a little send with a little kind of volume knob of its own right there that came up, which I can drag up and down. And that is now separate from the volume of the track itself. Although by default, if I bring up the routing for that, I'll bring up that routing again. By default, this is post fader, post pan. And what that means is that any effects that would be insert effects on this channel would be processed, then the volume level of this tra track, then the volume level of this track is taken into consideration before being sent to our reverb send. That way, if we 
decide later to turn this track up or down, the amount of reverb would move with it. We can decide to be pre-fader, which may be in your best interest depending on what you're doing, but generally in this case, post-fader is the best way to go. We can also see on these little routing lights here that our JHS track now has a glowing yellow stripe, which means that's being sent to somewhere, and then the reverb send has a little blue stripe, which means that's receiving something. It doesn't tell us all the details, but it tells us enough to know that something is going out and something is coming back in. If I hit play, I can hear quite a lot of reverb on there. If I turn up the room size, that makes things much more obvious in terms of what we can hear. But the, uh, the principle always stays the same, that the amount of volume you send from each track determines how much gets to that reverb. So if I had, say, this, this organ, and I did the same thing. I'll show you a cool shortcut. In the inserts and sends here, if I just go into the blank send space and see where one of these is lit up, if I drag that onto the reverb send, that will make me a reverb send in that one swift move. I can then turn that down a little if I so desire, but then now that organ and the backing track are both being sent to the same reverb, so we only have one reverb copy, which is very easy on the CPU, and if I want to change any settings, that now affects everything. So as your mixes get more complex, you're not having to do more work. Now onto editing, and editing you can do with the grid or without the grid, much like with the, uh, the MIDI editing that we just saw, but this will apply to both audio and MIDI. It may be something that happens to you a lot where you have something like a voiceover and there's a really good take but in the middle there's a cough or something or you need to start something a little later, a little earlier, chop off the start, chop off the end. All that kind of stuff is perfectly possible in Reaper. Let's start with this audio right here. We're currently snapped. One and two and a three and a four and one and two and three and a four. So that's all right, but at the start, we've got all this background noise going on and the same at the end. So what I'm going to do is hover the mouse over the left-hand side of this item and drag that. And you can see it's closing this down and it's doing it in with the grid. It is snapping to the nearest beat. So those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you can see the audio snapping to that one, two, three, four. If that's what you want, absolutely perfect. It may not be, in which case we can turn off this magnet at the top, the snap, and now when I move things, it's much smoother and gives me a much finer control. Although this does mean that anything that I move now, I could also click on this item and drag it around. That means that this is now not locked to the tempo, so I have to be very careful that accidentally slipping things out of place can cause some issues, so do be aware. Exactly the same can be done with a MIDI item. We can trim the starts, we can trim the ends. Another thing that we can do that's very important is split the audio. Let's say, for instance, where we said one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, that we want to remove, for example, the four in the middle. So let's take the playhead here and just play so we know what we're looking for. One and two and a three and a four and one and two. And so let's move this back onto the metronome just for a bit of neatness's sake. And I just drag the whole item onto a beat so that you can see the, uh, the start of that word, one, is on the line of that beat. So as I hit play, one and two and a three and a four and one and two and three and a four. So let's say I want to remove that word four. I can see from the sound as we go that it goes one 
and two and three and four. And I can play this back as many times as necessary by left clicking where I want and a four and four and four. There's the four. And now what I can do is hit the S key, S for split. And that will split the audio piece right down the middle, right there. And you can now see there are two separate pieces. And what I can do now is split on the other side of the four. And now I have that, that word four is a separate item. And what I can do is simply hit the delete key. And that is now gone. If we play that back, one and two and a three and a four and one and two and three and a four. And, a f and that four is almost gone. We can hear that there's a f. So I'm going to take the end of this piece where that f was and drag that back to make the gap wider. And a three and a f and one and two and three. And there we go. That was your first edit. Now, also, what we can do is fade this in and out. So rather than just cutting, what we could do is have the and here start to fade out. Now, on the left and right hand side of an audio or MIDI file, there is in the middle there the trim that we just used, but at the top corner is the fade. And if I drag that around, you'll see now that the audio, that big line, is starting to fade away as we tell it to. So I can use that however I see fit. I can fade something in very gently, I can cut it off quite quickly. And then where I'm hovering over that, that end here, if I right click, like I was saying before with all the menus, that brings up lots of options. That brings up the option for different types of fades, quicker ones, more late ones, more immediate. There's one that's called an S curve, which I tend to like quite a lot because it can be quite harsh and then quite subtle. And there's lots you can do with that in terms of editing your own music. One last thing that I want to add to the 101 Basics video is the philosophy of cascading audio, which is something that sounds like a lot of fancy words, but what that means is in Reaper specifically, audio flows upwards. There's a thing called folders, which we've not approached yet. And folders can be incredibly powerful in terms of organizing your sounds, working with a whole bunch of sounds in one big go and keeping things nice, neat and organized and relatively simple while still keeping all the options. So folders. Folders, just like everything else in Reaper, are just tracks. If I double click to make a track and I'm going to call this instruments, then what I can do is I'll drag this track up to the top because the way that folders work is they have a specific kind of order that things go in. Now, let's say that I wanted the JHS track and our audio track, Steve, and our organ track, George, to be inside of this folder. I shift clicked them all to select them all. And now I can drag these upwards and you'll see there's a faint gray line that has appeared on screen. On PC, that seems to be light blue. I'm not sure why it's gray here. But if I drag that up into instruments until it just indents just a little bit and let go, we can see now that those all indented by one. And now what's happening is all of the audio from these three tracks will go through our instruments track as a folder. So we can now see two meters moving here. And so our audio track that I recorded, one and two and a three and also goes through instruments and so does the organ. This can be useful for several reasons. Firstly, on this folder track, there's a tiny little down arrow now. If I click that, that makes things smaller. Click it again, they're even smaller still. Click it again and they pop back up to full size. So as your track count gets quite high and things get complicated, you can start to squash things down and keep things nice and neat and tidy. There's a little feature that should be enabled by default, I think, but isn't. If I right click on the master in the mixer, there's a whole set of options here, including one clickable icon for folder tracks to show slash hide children. I tend to have this selected. And what that means now, you can see these three tracks on the mixer window are indented. If I click the little down arrow, 
those are all now hidden and I'm now looking at just instruments and a reverb send. In this case, it seems a little redundant because I only had three tracks to work with, but when you get to a, a full production that's got 50, 100, 200 tracks going on, it can really be quite beneficial to distill it down into, let's say, just drums, bass, guitars, vocals. And then if you do need to go in and do finer work with a single track, you can just reopen the folder with this button and all your tracks, all your uh, levels, all your effects are all still there. Speaking of effects, if I was to add any kind of effect onto this instrument folder, that would apply to everything that is being fed through it. So every track that is inside that folder, the sound comes through the folder and then insert effects can be used to say, compress a group of vocals or EQ a group of drums or whatever it is that you may want to use. Stick around for another part in the series where I'll be talking about effects both internal and external, third party plugins and stock. But for now, hopefully, that's all you need to know to get going as the basics. I know it's been quite a long video and I appreciate you all watching. Stick around for the other parts of the series, which is the version that's on YouTube, because we'll be talking about effects, we'll be talking about drum routing, we'll be talking about some fancy things like surround sound. But in the meantime, check out the Ultimate Reaper Guide on Pro Mix Academy. It's where I take you through absolutely everything from start to finish as much as is humanly possible. We do a full recording and band mix. We do uh, a full rundown of some of the more fancy advanced features that might really help Reaper be the one for you and so much more than we can cover on YouTube. But for now, thanks everybody for watching and I'll see you in the next section of the tutorial. Goodbye for now.